Welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast, brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach. Each week, Sam Smith breaks down high yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Perspective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. This podcast covers all things viruses. I first talk about virus structure, and then I get into the general viral life cycle. And then I get a little more specific and I talk about the life cycle of bacteriophages and retroviruses, which, by the way, both share some similar characteristics. Next, I get into virus classification, then virus mutation, and then lastly, I talk about subviral particles. This material is mostly going to show up in one of the four sections that's the bio biochem section. As always, I hope this podcast helps as you prep for the MCAT. So I want to start out by giving just the general definition of a virus. You know, when I think of a virus, I tend to think of like these teeny little particles of some type of matter that cause a ton of damage. Basically, these evil little things that you can't see but are pretty bad. The NIH defines a virus a little bit differently. They define it as a small collection of genetic code, either DNA or RNA, that is surrounded by a protein coat. Further, they say that viruses cannot replicate alone. Right, viruses must infect cells, host cells, and use components of that cell to make copies of themselves. Often in this process, they end up killing the host cell, which is how they can cause so much damage to the host organism itself. So in short, viruses have two components, genetic code, which is DNA or RNA, and protein. Also, they are not living organisms themselves, but actually rely on living organisms to replicate. Okay, next, let's talk about virus structure. To some extent, virus structure depends upon the type of virus we're looking at, right? Are we looking at HIV? Are we looking at SARS? Are we looking at MERS? All of these viruses have slightly different structures, but all viruses share two specific characteristics. That's that they contain, number one, nucleic acid, and that's DNA or RNA. We talked a little bit about that. That's the genetic material that these viruses have. It encodes proteins. The second component that they have is a protective protein coat called the capsid. And this capsid surrounds the genetic material. So those are the most basic structures of a virus. But viruses can have other features as well. Uh, They can have an envelope. An envelope is an outer layer of protection. It surrounds the capsid, which of course contains the genetic material. It's composed of phospholipids, proteins, and sometimes glycoproteins, which are just carbohydrate protein hybrids. And the envelope of a virus is actually derived from the plasma membrane of the cell that a virus replicates in. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but basically enveloped viruses steal a little bit of the cell's plasma membrane as they bud out of the cell. Now with that said, not all viruses are enveloped. Non-enveloped viruses include adenoviruses, which cause a bunch of different diseases like meningitis and encephalitis, as well as HPV or human papillomavirus. HPV is the most commonly sexually transmitted infection, and you you probably have the vaccine for it. It can actually cause cancer. The virus, of course, not the vaccine. And just a little bit of an interesting aside, enveloped viruses can be a little easier to take care of since The lipid bilayer envelope is sensitive to heat and detergents, like soap. Basically, enveloped viruses are easier to sterilize than non-enveloped viruses and have limited survival outside of host environments. And therefore, enveloped viruses typically must transfer directly from host to host. And this is why washing your hands with soap and water is effective in eliminating SARS-CoV-2 particles. You don't need the alcohol-based hand sanitizers to do it, right? This SARS-2-CoV is an enveloped virus, and therefore you can break up its envelope just using soap and water, which will kill the virus. Okay, so envelopes are another component that viruses can have. Now, a weird case of a virus, at least in my opinion, are bacteriophages. Bacteriophages can have a head, collar, tail, as well as tail fibers, and a base plate. 
And honestly, they look like they could be in an episode of Black Mirror. A six-foot bacteriophage is not something I would want to fuck with. <laughs> if you don't know what they look like, I recommend just go Googling it. It, it. It's also been described as like a moon lander. They're very weird-looking viruses. And because they're weird-looking, they have weird structures, and they have these components that other viruses just don't have. And again, these components are a head, a collar, a tail, tail fibers, and a base plate. The next optional component of a virus are viral regulatory and accessory proteins. These are non-essential proteins that regulate virus replication and the virus life cycle. And these are proteins that are found somewhere inside the virus particle, whether that's just inside the envelope or inside the capsid of an enveloped virus. Of course, for a non-enveloped virus, these accessory or regulatory proteins must be found inside the capsid. And I'll talk about HIV in, in, in a sec here, and I'll give you some examples of what these regulatory and accessory proteins are. So that's basically it for virus structure. Again, in general, viruses have two components. That is nucleic acid and a protein capsid. And then there are a few other components that they can have but don't necessarily have to have. That is a viral envelope. And then I mentioned a bunch of different structures for bacteriophages. And then, of course, these viral regulatory or accessory proteins. I also want to say that in terms of their size, viruses are way, way smaller than eukaryotic cells and bacterial cells. According to the cell size and scale resource provided by the University of Utah, which, by the way, you should check out. It kind of helps visualize the scale, the size scale of different biological molecules. It's pretty cool. But... According to it, a virus particle is about 200 times smaller than a bacterial cell and about 2,000 times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. Let me give you a little analogy just to put this in perspective. So comparing a virus to a bacteria in size would be like comparing me to two full-size basketball courts. And when we talk about comparing a virus to a eukaryotic cell, that would be like comparing me to one and a half football fields. And this is all to say that viruses are just really, really small little things that can go in and infect eukaryotic cells and bacterial cells. All right, before I move on to the viral life cycle, I want to summarize this all by talking about the structure of one of the most difficult, notorious viruses, that's human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. HIV is a retrovirus, which I'll talk a little bit more about retroviruses in the next segment. And HIV has been in the United States since somewhere around the late 70s, early 80s, and there's still not a vaccine, nor is there any vaccine on the horizon. PrEP, which is an HIV prophylaxis, is really the closest thing that we have to an HIV vaccine. And I'll talk a little bit about why it's so hard to create an HIV vaccine um, in a sec, but anyways, let's talk about the structure of HIV. So an HIV viral particle is spherical in shape. And HIV is an enveloped virus, so the first structure that I would see as I come upon this virus is its envelope. And further, I'd see some structures that are actually protruding from the surface of this envelope. These structures would be glycoproteins, which are just protein-carbohydrate hybrids. And these glycoproteins are called GP120 and GP41, which stands for glycoprotein 120 and glycoprotein 41. And what these glycoproteins do for the virus is they mediate its attachment and entry into host cells. And of course, these glycoproteins sit in the envelope of HIV, which again is mostly made up of phospholipids. Now let's say that I crack open this HIV virus particle like a hazelnut. I'd see one main structure, and that would be the capsid. If I were to then crack open the capsid, I'd see a bunch more things. I'd see first the RNA genome of HIV. Then I'd see proteins that are actually bound to this RNA. And this protein is called nucleocapsid, which is an important protein for viral replication. And then I'd see a bunch of other proteins floating around in the capsid. I'd see reverse transcriptase. And that functions to actually turn this RNA genome into a DNA genome. I'd see integrase. Integrase helps integrate the DNA from this RNA genome into the host cell. And then I'd see a few more accessory proteins. I'd see one called GAG, NEF, TAT, and REV. Obviously, the names of these proteins are, are not important to know for the MCAT, but just understand that when I crack open that capsid, I see a bunch of nucleic acid and a bunch of proteins. 
All right, so that's a little bit on virus structure. The next thing I wanna talk about is the viral life cycle. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to a medical school don't even get accepted. And if you wanna get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. That's why more students than ever are turning to MCAT tutoring by Med School Coach. Our tutors are all 99th percentile scorers, have been through rigorous training, and can help raise your MCAT score by 12 points or more. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into med school. So why not get one-on-one -on -one tutoring from Med School Coach? Our expert team will create a custom program just for you and help you master MCAT content where you need the help most. You'll raise your MCAT score. We guarantee it. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10% up to $400 on a Med School Coach MCAT tutoring package. You can achieve your medical school dreams and Med School Coach can help. Like viral structure, what a virus's life cycle looks like depends on what type of virus we're talking about. In general, and at the most basic level, all virus cycles have three steps. Cell entry, replication, and cell exit. Let's go through these steps, and I'll use as an example SARS-CoV-2. And then I'll talk about some interesting cases of viral life cycles. I'll talk about bacteriophage life cycles and retrovirus life cycle. Okay, so before I jump in, I want you to have this all organized in your head. So again, there are three steps of viral life cycle, that being cell entry, replication, and cell exit. And each of these steps is further broken down. So cell entry is broken down into attachment and penetration. Replication is broken down into uncoding, gene expression, and assembly. And then cell exit basically has one step, which is the release of these viral particles. One, cell entry. During cell entry, a virus passes through the plasma membrane of a host cell and gets inside the host cell. And again, this has two steps, attachment and penetration. Let's talk about these steps for SARS-CoV-2. So in attachment, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, which is just a protein found in the envelope of SARS-CoV-2, is what mediates cell attachment. And this spike protein has two domains, S1 and S2, and they both play different roles in this attachment process. As the virus floats by a cell, the S1 region of the spike protein mediates its binding to receptors on the surface of host cells. And the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is called ACE2, or angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. And this receptor is expressed by cells all over the body. So that's attachment. Once the virus has attached to a cell, serine proteases on the surface of the cell cleave the S1 subunit from the S2 subunit on the spike protein. This then allows the S2 domain of the S protein to do its job, which it induces fusion between the viral envelope and the cellular membrane. Once this fusion process occurs, the contents of the viral particle, again, we're talking about SARS-CoV-2, is emptied into the cell. The next step in this process is replication. At this point, a virus hijacks the cell's protein machinery to make more copies of itself. And again, there are three steps here, uncoding, gene expression, and assembly. For SARS-CoV-2, uncoding is a stepwise process in which the SARS-CoV-2 genome is released from the capsid into the host cell. Now with that said, SARS viruses have an RNA genome, so this RNA is then released into the host cell. At this point, virus gene expression can occur. Basically, this RNA genome is converted into real proteins, and real viral proteins. Now SARS, as I said, are RNA viruses, but further, they're positive strand or positive sense RNA viruses. These are the type of viruses that can be directly translated into protein. Basically, the viral genome acts just like mRNA. So in this step of the process, ribosomes take this RNA and translate it into viral proteins. The RNA genome of SARS-CoV-2 encodes 12 proteins, some of which are structural proteins like the S protein, and some of which are accessory proteins that assist in this translation process. Okay, so that is gene expression. The next step is assembly. This is where mature SARS-CoV-2 particles are formed. So in this step, structural proteins and viral RNA come together to form 
the capsid structure. And this is actually a spontaneous process, which to me sounds a little bit like dark magic. However, it's, it's not quite that. This comes from a review called The Mechanisms of Viral Assembly by Perlmutter and Hagen. Quote, in many cases, assembly is primarily driven by hydrophobic interactions, attenuated by electrostatics, with directional specificity imposed by electrostatic, van der Waals, and hydrogen bonding interactions. End quote. In other words, all these different interactions I just described, you know, hydrophobic, electrostatics, van der Waals, these are all the forces that kind of pull together and hold together the RNA genome and the capsid. So at this point, what do we have? We have these SARS-CoV-2 particles, but of course, they're only capsid surrounding an RNA genome. Uh, as I've said, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is enveloped, and the enveloping process comes at the next step, cell exit. So at this step, assembled virus particles exit the cell and go on to infect other cells. And again, I hope you're thinking to yourself, okay, what, what about the envelope of this virus? So essentially, this is what happens. Spike glycoproteins, which again are that S protein, is a structural protein of SARS, are embedded into the plasma membrane of the host cell after they're translated. Thus, the virus is actually hijacking the endomembrane system of the host cell. So after these spike glycoproteins are embedded in the host cell's membrane, the assembled capsid surrounding this RNA genome makes its way towards the plasma membrane where these spike proteins are located and then buds out of the cell carrying this bit of plasma membrane with it. And again, that bit of plasma membrane has these viral spike proteins in it. And then after this budding process, we now have a fully assembled, enveloped SARS-CoV-2 virus that can go on and infect other cells. Let me just quickly summarize that. There are three main or general steps to a virus's life cycle. Cell entry, replication, and cell exit. During cell entry, the virus must first attach to the cell and then penetrate the cell. Then during replication, the virus will uncoat. It'll express its genes to produce viral proteins. And then these proteins will assemble to make viral particles. Lastly, the virus must exit the cell and go on to infect other host cells. And in some cases during this exit process, if we're talking about an enveloped virus, the virus will actually take some of the cell's plasma membrane with it, and that becomes the virus's envelope. So again, that's kind of the most general case of a viral life cycle. There are two other cases though that I wanna talk about that are a little bit different than that. The first being bacteriophage life cycle, and the second being retrovirus life cycle. I'll start with bacteriophage life cycle. So bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. And again, these are those scary looking uh, like moon lander type viruses. And bacteriophages have two different life cycles. But before I get into them, I, I wanna talk about bacteriophages more generally. Now, the reason that they look like moon landers is because they kind of perform the same function as a moon lander, only they're landing on the surface of a bacteria instead of the moon. So once they kind of land on the surface of a bacteria, they inject their DNA into the bacteria's cells. And obviously this is quite a bit different than how the SARS virus gets into a cell. As I talked about earlier, it actually binds to receptors on the surface of a cell and then fuses with the membrane of that cell, releasing its genetic material and proteins into the cell. Here though, of course, we're talking about a virus that's literally landing on the surface of a cell and injecting its DNA or its genetic material into the cell. So with that said, bacteriophages have two different life cycles. They have what's called the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. In the lytic cycle, the phage infects a bacteria and hijacks its machinery to make lots and lots and lots of copies of itself. Then it kills the cell by essentially making it explode as all these newly formed virus particles exit the cell. Thus, the lytic cycle lyses the cell. I typically remember this by associating the words lyse and lytic. They're both fairly short words as compared to lysogenic, and so that just kind of helps me remember that lyse goes with lytic, and then lysogenic is different. And I'll talk about that one next. So in the lysogenic cycle, the bacteriophage infects a bacteria, 
and then inserts its DNA into the DNA of the bacteria. And remember, bacteria have a single circular chromosome. And so what happens in this cycle is that the bacteriophage injects its DNA into that bacteria, that DNA makes its way towards that circular chromosome, and then is integrated into the circular chromosome. And this allows the phage DNA to be copied and passed along to each of the progeny of that single bacteria that contain this viral DNA. Basically, every time this bacteria divides, it's also replicating the viral DNA that are integrated into its single circular chromosome. And then under certain circumstances, this bacteriophage DNA can become active, and basically it exits this lysogenic cycle and starts producing viral particles again and enters the lytic cycle. And again, in this cycle, a bunch of viral particles are produced, and eventually that leads to a cell bursting because it's just so full of these virus particles. So I can summarize this by saying that the lytic cycle of a bacteriophage is when that bacteriophage is actively replicating inside of a bacteria. On the other hand, the lysogenic cycle of a bacteriophage's life cycle is when the virus is dormant, right? Its DNA is just kind of hanging out inside of the cell. And of course, this integrated DNA can get activated and the virus can move from the lysogenic cycle into the lytic cycle and begin producing virus particles. Now I want to talk about retroviruses. So retroviruses are a group of RNA viruses which insert a DNA copy of their viral genome into the host cell's genome in order to replicate. The most probably well-known example of a retrovirus is HIV. All retroviruses contain a few common components. They have, as I said, an RNA genome, and then they have two other unique proteins. One's called reverse transcriptase, and the other is called integrase. Reverse transcriptase just converts the viral RNA genome into DNA. It's doing the reverse of transcription, hence its name, reverse transcriptase. And then integrase is a protein that helps the reverse transcribed DNA actually integrate into the DNA or into the chromosomes of the host cell. Now, with that said, let me go over the life cycle of a retrovirus. And really, retroviruses follow a lot of the same steps as other viruses and, and kind of follow this general outline that I went over earlier. But there's a few steps that they don't share with others because what they do is unique. So the first step in the life cycle of a retrovirus is binding and fusion to the host cell membrane. This is cell entry. For HIV, its receptor is the CD4 receptor, which is the main receptor on a CD4 T cell or a helper T cell. Once this occurs, the second step of the life cycle is reverse transcription. In this step, the reverse transcriptase protein that comes with the virus converts the RNA genome into DNA. The third step in a retrovirus's life cycle is integration. At this point, DNA is integrated into the host cell chromosomes. Now, for as long as that host cell lives, this viral DNA will be part of the cell. Further, when this cell replicates and splits into daughter cells, this viral DNA will be copied and included in the chromosomes of those daughter cells. And one other thing I'll mention here is that the viral DNA that's integrated into the host genome is called proviral DNA. From there, the fourth step of a retrovirus's lifestyle, <laughs> I mean life cycle, is transcription. At this point, the proviral DNA is transcribed into viral proteins. The fifth step is assembly. At this point, the virus particles are assembled. And then last but not least is budding. Virus particles, minus of course the envelope, make their way to the surface of the cell, and then they bud out of that cell and they take a little bit of cell plasma membrane with them because of course HIV is an enveloped virus. So as you could probably put together, the steps that are reverse transcription and integration are the steps that are unique to a retrovirus. And these steps are also what makes HIV so freaking hard to cure because once it infects a cell, it's essentially going to live and hide out in that cell until the cell dies. And sometimes, of course, the virus will cause the cell to die, but that's only if the virus is actively replicating a whole bunch inside that cell. There's some cells where the virus will integrate into, 
And then those cells will just go on to kind of live quiet lives and the virus will just kind of hang out inside of them. And then for reasons that are unknown to science, that virus will then become active and start producing these HIV viral particles. And that's why somebody who has HIV must be on medication for their whole lives. Because as soon as they get off medication, these cells that are harboring the virus that are kind of quiet and, and latent, so to speak, will start actively replicating again, and that person could get really sick. Now, before I go on to virus classification, I want to first delineate between virus transduction and virus transfection. These are two words that you may see come up on the MCAT, so it's important that you know the difference between both of them. Virus transduction refers to transfer of genetic material from one cell to another by a virus. So an example of this might be like a bacteriophage picking up some of the host bacteria cell DNA instead of its own. And then when this virus bursts through the cell and goes and injects the DNA it contains into another bacteria, it's essentially taking that DNA from the other bacteria cell and giving it to the other bacteria that it's trying to infect. And that is transduction. Transfection, on the other hand, is the process of introducing nucleic acids into cells by non-viral methods. If you've ever introduced a plasmid into a bacterial cell in, in a lab setting, you'll know that you can do this by heat shocking the bacteria. And this is an example of transfection, right? I'm introducing a plasmid, which by the way is just a piece of circular DNA, into a bacterial cell, but I'm not doing it using a virus, I'm doing it using heat shock. So again, transduction is the transfer of genetic material from one cell to another by a virus, whereas transfection is the process of introducing nucleic acids into cells by non-viral methods. Transduction, virus, transfection, non-virus. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. It's a complicated process, and even students with great grades and MCAT scores get left out. That's why more students than ever are turning to Med School Coach for admissions advising. Our advisors are all physicians and former admissions committee members, so they know exactly what medical schools are looking for. One-on-one -on -one admissions advising from Med School Coach makes all the difference. Our expert team will help you develop a game plan, prepare your application, edit your essays, and coach you for interviews. Every pre-med has a story, and we'll help you tell it so you can stand out from the crowd. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400, on a Med School Coach admissions advising package. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and Med School Coach can help. The next thing I want to talk about here is virus classification. So there's a ton of different ways that viruses can be classified, but I think the system that is most important to know for the MCAT is called the Baltimore system, and it classifies viruses based upon their nucleic acid. And it's actually named after a Caltech professor and researcher named David Baltimore. And I thought that maybe the system was established sometime in like the 1600s by uh, Lord Baltimore, who was one of the first governors of Maryland, or I guess was the very first governor of Maryland. Um, but obviously, it's a much more recent classification system, especially considering they had no idea what a virus was back then. Um, but anyways, let me jump into this classification system. According to the system, there are seven different types of viruses, and this all has to do with the genetic material that these viruses contain. They are one, double-stranded DNA viruses, Two, single-stranded DNA viruses. Three, double-stranded reverse transcriptase viruses. Four, double-stranded RNA viruses. Single-stranded RNA viruses, and those can either be five, positive sense, or six, negative sense. Seven, and then single-stranded RNA reverse transcriptase viruses. Double-stranded DNA viruses include things like adenovirus and herpes virus, and these viruses must be transcribed to RNA and then translated into protein in order to produce mature virions. Likewise, single-stranded DNA viruses must be transcribed to RNA and then translated into protein to produce virus particles. Now, double-stranded DNA reverse transcriptase viruses 
like hepatitis B, for example, are hella weird. So this is what they do. Their DNA genome is first transcribed to RNA and then reverse transcribed back into DNA, at which point it is then transcribed and translated into viral proteins. So uh, they do this weird thing where they go to RNA, then back to DNA, and then can make viral proteins. And in my opinion, because of this, they are the weirdest type of virus. And again, hepatitis B is an example of a double-stranded reverse transcriptase virus. The next type of genome that a virus can have is a double-stranded RNA genome. And in this case, the double-stranded RNA must be first converted into positive sense single-stranded RNA, and then at that point it can be directly transcribed to produce viral proteins. Next is single-stranded RNA viruses, and there are two types of single-stranded RNA viruses. There are positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses, just called sense RNA viruses, and then there are negative sense or anti-sense single-stranded RNA viruses. The main difference here is that for single-stranded positive sense RNA viruses like coronavirus, their genomes can be directly translated to make protein. Basically, their genomes act like normal mRNA. On the other hand, anti-sense single-stranded RNA viruses like influenza have a genome that must first be converted into positive sense single-stranded RNA before it can be translated into viral proteins. In other words, for negative sense or anti-sense single-stranded RNA viruses, there is this intermediate step where you take that anti-sense RNA and convert it into positive sense RNA or sense RNA that then can be translated into viral proteins. Next and last are single-stranded RNA reverse transcriptase viruses, and this includes retroviruses that I talked about earlier, like HIV. And in order to replicate what they have to do is they have to first reverse transcribe their RNA genome into DNA and then integrate their DNA into the host genome. And then from there, those viral proteins can be expressed by all the normal machinery of the host cell. For the MCAT, what I'd focus on knowing is kind of four of these, which are the single-stranded and double-stranded DNA, and then the positive sense single-stranded RNA and the negative sense single-stranded RNA. And what I'd really focus on knowing is the general process by which these genomes are converted into viral proteins, kind of exactly what I explained. Because, for example, the MCAT might say something like, virus XYZ enters into a cell and its genome is immediately translated into protein with no intermediate steps. Then it might ask, you know, what type of virus is this? And, of course, you would need to recognize that this is a positive-sense single-stranded RNA virus since it's directly transcribed into protein in the host cell. Okay, the last two things I want to talk about in this podcast are viral mutation and subviral particles, and I'll go through these relatively fast. Do viruses really mutate super fast? And if so, why do they mutate so fast? These are questions that I know you probably ponder on a daily basis, so let me answer them for you. I'll start by saying that when scientists look at genome mutation rates, whether that's in viruses, bacteria, eukaryotes, they look at it in terms of mutations per site. See, theoretically, the longer an organism's or virus's genome is, the more mutation you'll see overall. Right? The, the, the longer the genome, the more time a polymerase has to flub up and add the wrong nucleotide at some point along the genome. So to get rid of this confounding factor, meaning the length of a genome, scientists look again at mutation per site. Basically, they track the number of mutations at a particular locus in the genome. This is a simple example of what they do, but essentially they compare a 100 base stretch of nucleotides in eukaryotes then a 100 base stretch in a virus, and a 100 base stretch in a bacteria. And from there, they can get a better idea of the relative rate of mutation of that organism or virus. And this type of experiment, of course, has been done. And in a review paper called Viral Mutation Rates in the Journal of Virology by Belshaw and Associates, they reported that mutation rates for organisms and viruses looks like the following. RNA viruses have the highest mutation rate, and their mutation rate is quite a bit higher than DNA viruses, which is the next highest mutation rate. Then come bacteria, 
And then last are eukaryotes with the lowest mutation rate per site. So again, in decreasing mutation rate, it goes RNA viruses, DNA viruses, bacteria, eukaryotes. And just to give you a sense of scale, RNA viruses mutation rate is about 10 million times greater than a eukaryotic cell. So that's just, that's honestly kind of wild. 10 million times greater. I'm sure that if our cells mutated that quickly, we, we'd be dead pretty fast. And honestly, I bet that that high of a mutation rate would be lethal for a growing embryo. Anyways, what I want to talk about now, and probably what you're wondering, is why do viruses, especially RNA viruses, mutate this much? To answer this question, I'm referencing a paper in PLUS One called, quote, Why Are RNA Virus Mutation Rates So Damn High? And it was written by Dr. Duffy. So the first thing you got to understand here is that DNA viruses replicate their DNA using DNA polymerase. And that is the same way that eukaryotic cells replicate their DNA. DNA polymerase has the ability to actually go back and check on its work. It has exonuclease activity. It can remove and replace bases that are errors. You know, if it was supposed to put an A and it accidentally put a G, it can be like, ah, shit, and go back in and take out that G and replace it with an A. As a result, DNA polymerase is high fidelity. It doesn't mess up very much. On the other hand, RNA viruses replicate their RNA via RNA polymerase. This RNA polymerase must be encoded by the virus because host RNA polymerases function to convert DNA to mRNA. It's not going to replicate RNA like the virus wants it to do. As a result, this RNA polymerase is a lot lower fidelity. It doesn't have that exonuclease activity. It can't go back and check on its work to make sure that it got it right. And therefore, it messes up a lot more than the DNA polymerase does. So that's kind of the main reason why RNA viruses mutate so damn fast. The RNA polymerase that replicates their RNA genome just has much lower fidelity. It messes up a lot more. It incorporates these wrong bases, leading to more mutation. Now, with that said, mutation actually can be helpful for viruses in some ways. It allows them to respond quickly to selection pressures. A great example of this is HIV. So one of the treatments that's been suggested for HIV that is, is more of a long-term, you know, once-a-month injection would be an antibody therapy. Basically, you infuse antibodies that bind to HIV and help the immune system clear it. And these antibodies circulate in the blood at good levels for ab about a month at a time. So in theory, you could give injections of antibodies to an HIV patient once a month, and they wouldn't have to take their daily regimen of antiretroviral pills that they do. However, what scientists have noticed is that this type of treatment, antibody therapy, controls the HIV infection for a while, like maybe a few weeks or even a month, but then the virus will actually reemerge. And by sequencing, what they can see is that the virus mutated at a single point or a series of points that allowed the virus to escape the antibody. So the part of the virus's genome that codes for whatever protein that the antibody was binding to mutated in a way that now the antibody wouldn't work against the virus. And it's not like HIV knows, you know, that, hey, I got to mutate right here to escape this therapy. Mutations happen randomly, right? And there's millions and millions of copies of this virus floating around the body. And so you get some mutation that randomly happens in one of the copies of this virus floating around the body. And now this protein on the surface of the virus that the antibody binds to looks a little bit different. And that allows this form of the virus, the mutated form, to reproduce at a greater rate than the other virus that the antibody works against. And so over time, what you see happen is that the whole population of virus in this HIV patient becomes the type that evades the antibody. And eventually this leads to the antibody basically doing nothing because now all the virus in the body is of this one type that the antibody just doesn't work against. And so you can see then that the high mutation rate of an RNA virus, and again, HIV is an RNA virus, is, is somewhat helpful. If there is some selection pressure like an antibody, that virus can respond very quickly to that selection pressure and evade a therapy or even evade the body's immune system.
Viruses can also mutate to become more or less virulent or, or more or less harmful. Take, for example, the 1918 influenza pandemic, also called the Spanish flu. And by the way, it, it actually came from Kansas, most likely. So uh, the term Spanish flu isn't quite right. And the reason, historically speaking, why it's called Spanish flu is because in 1918, we were in, in the war, World War I. And at that time, the U.S., along with its allies and people who were fighting against us in the war, didn't want to really talk about you know, their soldiers getting sick and getting sick with flu. However, my understanding is that Spain was not involved in the war. And so they kind of freely talked about their people getting the flu. And, and you know, that was headlines in the newspapers and so on. And so people began to associate the flu with being Spanish because they're the only ones even talking about it. Anyways, well, what happened in this 1918 influenza pandemic was that there was a first wave of influenza, and by the way, influenza is an RNA virus, and the first wave was, was kind of bad, you know, people died and, and, and it was bad, but then a second wave came, and, and really what happened was the virus mutated a little bit to become more virulent, and that second wave was way, way, way worse in terms of deaths than the first wave. And again, this is because that virus mutated. So the takeaway message here is that, yes, viruses mutate more than bacteria and eukaryotes, and moreover, RNA viruses mutate faster than DNA viruses. And this has to do with the fact that RNA polymerase has a lower fidelity than DNA polymerase. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in this podcast are subviral particles. And there are two types of subviral particles that I want to talk about, virioids and prions. So in general, subviral particles are entities that are simpler than viruses that can cause disease. And what's simpler than a virus, you ask? Well, viruses are made up of genetic material and proteins. So take those two apart. What are we left with? Genetic material on its own and proteins on its own. And that's what virioids and prions are made out of. Virioids are RNA-only infectious agents. This is RNA that is typically between 250 and about 500 nucleotides long, and it's RNA that's infectious, I and mean, these are only found in plants. Prions, on the other hand, are protein-only infectious agents. They're misfolded proteins with the ability to transmit their misfolded shape onto normal or wild-type proteins of the same type. Basically, they're proteins that are a bad influence on other proteins. And to me, this works a little bit like crystallization. So in crystallization, you start with a seed. And in terms of prions, this is like a single misfolded protein. And then this seed triggers other proteins to misfold, like a single crystal seed starts a cascade of crystallization. And in this process, more and more and more proteins misfold and aggregates form in a cell. And this will eventually lead to cell death. So again, prions are infectious proteins. All right, so that does it for the viruses podcast. As always, thanks for listening to this podcast, and I really do hope that it helped in your studies. Also, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to reach out to me on email. I always love hearing from people. My email is in the show notes. And don't forget, if you like what we do, please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us grow in the rankings and helps us reach more students. Last but not least, I am producing a full-length audio course. It's going to be in the form of an iPhone app. Um, there will be a lot more custom ability with it, and I think it'll be something that will be really useful when it does come out. So be on the lookout for that. You know, don't give up that which makes you you. You know, uh, mm -hmm. medicine will, medical education will, you know, not intentionally, but will give you the impression that the only thing that you are allowed to do is study medicine. And... You know, that's a terrible way to go. It can create all kinds of problems for you, um, you know, emotionally and physically and, and just make you, you know, it, it can stunt you, I think. That was a clip from the Perspective Doctor podcast with Dave Etler, who is a podcast host himself. He hosts a podcast that is put out by the Carver College of Medicine at the University of Iowa. The Perspective Doctor podcast is great, and I really enjoy listening to it. And in fact, a few weeks ago, I had a medical school interview, and we were talking about the role of humanities in medicine in the interview, and I had listened to the podcast 
with Dave Etler a little bit before that, and, and their conversation was along those lines too. And um, honestly, I found it super helpful. So if you're interested in learning more about medicine and you are a prospective doctor, listen to the podcast. Each episode of MCAT Basics is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including MCAT tutoring and medical school admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for the MCAT, and we hope you tune in again next time.